Uh, continuing on uh, with uh, our partner manager um, uh, interviews associated with the commercial crew program, uh, one of the unique uh, opportunities was uh, one of the partners, uh, Valen Thorne, who is based here at the Johnson Space Center. He's actually uh, uh, co-located uh, with uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation uh, out uh, near Boulder, Colorado. And uh, we also had an opportunity uh, earlier in the week uh, to talk to Valen about his role as the partner manager uh, for Sierra Nevada Corporation. Well, welcome. Uh, I'd like to welcome Valen Thorne, who is the commercial crew program partner manager for uh, Sierra Nevada, uh, one of the companies that's part of the uh, uh, commercial crew program Space Act agreements. Uh, it's a pretty exciting time. Uh, Valen is. Uh, uh, actually embedded with uh, Sierra Nevada out uh, in Colorado. Valen, thanks a lot for joining us uh, today. Hello, Kyle. Good morning. I'm really glad to be here. Well, it's, you're kind of in an unusual situation. Of course, you're based here at the Johnson Space Center, but you're actually, uh, uh, at least as far as I can tell, the only partner manager that's based out in um, with the company like that. And uh, uh, it, that's got to be a unique situation probably for you and, uh, and even for Sierra Nevada, huh? Well, it certainly is. Uh, in the long history of NASA's government industry partnerships, typically NASA will have people in residence with, uh, with our, our partners. Uh, even when we're in a contract relationship and not a commercial partnership, we've, we've had relationships like that. Uh, so it's not, uh, it's not completely unusual for, for NASA to have this kind of arrangement. Uh, it, I am the first for the commercial crew program to go in residence with a partner. And the, the thinking behind that is that uh, with our partners leading their development projects, uh, to have uh, some senior NASA management there on location with the partner provides some additional insight. Uh, it improves communication. And, you know, it allows, allows me to kind of see on a day-to-day -day level how things are working with our partner and how, how our people who are participating in helping our, our partners, uh, how effectively that's working. Yeah, it's probably it's a pretty interesting interesting situation. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit here, but uh, you know, for everybody that's uh, tuning in, um, talk a little bit about your career. How'd you even get involved in NASA? How long have you been here? And um, uh, you know, where'd you go to school? Those types of things. Right. I, I went to Arizona State University. I grew up in Arizona mostly. I studied aeronautical technology, technology and engineering. Um, but my first job was with the Space Shuttle Prime Contractor, that was Rockwell International, uh, which is now part of Boeing. And so within a few years, you know, even though I'd mostly been studying uh, atmospheric flight, uh, I was basically uh, teaching orbital mechanics and space mission analysis and design. So, so you're always learning. You get into your job, and every day you're learning. It never stops. Uh, so I've been working in uh, human space flight uh, ever since. Uh, I spent eight years working the space shuttle program and advanced programs for Rockwell. Um, uh, I ended up uh, working shuttle entry guidance and performance and, uh, and also ended up leading teams planning space shuttle missions. Uh, so I, I worked a number of those uh, before going uh, then to Grumman Aerospace uh, for a few years uh, to work the space station program. <clears throat> and then I went over to NASA. So in total, I had about 15 years working the space station program. I uh, ended up uh, working as the manager of systems engineering and integration, we call it the Viper team, uh, as well as strategic planning and requirements, which was the Sabre team. Uh, and in that, those roles, we determined the overall space station configuration, uh, the assembly sequence and integration with the space shuttle, uh, integrated performance optimization, with logistics support like resupply uh, for, for supplies for the crew, as well as kind of planning for getting the crews on board. Um, the last six years, I've been working NASA's commercial spaceflight programs. Uh, began with the COTS projects with SpaceX and Orbital Sciences, and then with the commercial crew program, uh, working with uh, Boeing, uh, SpaceX again, Sierra Nevada Corporation, and several other partners. Uh, so for the last year, though, uh, I've been working with Sierra Nevada uh, out here in Colorado in residence. Sierra Nevada is in Louisville, Colorado. Uh, that's near Denver and near Boulder. Um, uh, my wife, who also works for NASA, she's come out here and she's working. She works for the, the program scientist office for the International Space Station program, and, and there's some projects they have that uh, are very compatible with teleworking. And so she's uh, she's here uh, with me and and working with the space station program, and it's been working very well. 
Well, that's, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, so you, you kind of describe a little bit about your role with uh, Sierra Nevada being Im embedded with them. Um, obviously, operating under the Space Act agreements that, that the program is under right now, it's kind of a new way of doing business, but how do you, how do you exactly integrate yourself with a company like that? Well, you know, I don't know if it's so much different than our, our previous government industry partnerships. Uh, certainly the way we've normally uh, done business in developing the space shuttle and the, the, the Apollo programs, uh, NASA very much took the lead in the development, but still 85% of the effort was being done by American industry uh, with NASA's lead. Uh, now in this program, NASA is, is helping several companies develop commercial space lines. Uh, the difference is that the companies are leading their own engineering development with our assistance. And the purpose behind that is to allow uh, uh, different companies to innovate in different ways and not to dictate particular solutions to problems. Uh, we're providing financial assistance. We're providing technical assistance. Uh, but it's still very much a, a good close partnership, and we work closely together. I, I wouldn't say that it's been any more of a unique challenge, um, certainly for NASA as we uh, as we work in these commercial partnerships, it's a different, it's a different environment, and and uh, to take more of an assisting partner and kind of a consultant role is a different model uh, for NASA. So there's some transition for people to get used to that kind of a relationship, uh, but still it's it's very rewarding. Uh, one of the advantages is our commercial partners tend to move faster than we than we do with our larger uh, our larger development efforts that we've historically had, and so then you also have several different program concepts and development. So it's, it's in many ways, it's actually more intellectually stimulating for, for the NASA people who are helping. Uh, they're contributing to several different programs. They move much faster. Um, and so in many ways, it uh, makes it uh, more rewarding. <clears throat> yeah, part, of, part of the structure, as I understand it, is, uh, you know, the Space Act agreement structure is, at least with these companies, is, you know, based on milestones. And that's kind of different than a, a contract relationship. Can you to kind of describe um, the structure of those milestones, like what's what's actually been done to date and, and some of the milestones that are upcoming relative to uh, Sierra? Sure, really, and, and to, to begin to understand that, you, people have to know how we normally do business, which is in a contract structure we call cost plus. And so our, our industry partners and in those contracts, cost plus contracts, uh, uh, they do whatever work that is required to get the job done, and they get a, a, a profit added on top of that. Um, and so with that kind of an approach, pretty much everyone who's working for the company is charging their time, and that just gets billed to NASA. Uh, and so that relationship tends to not always be the most efficient because sometimes it's an incentive to do more work because the more work you do, the more money the company makes. And this model, the NASA's investment is fixed. And we, we meter out that investment as the companies make progress. So we have these progress milestones. We'll call them funding milestones. They're usually tied to some key development effort for the partner. And when we see that they've completed that, that performance milestone, then they'll get some additional funding uh, from NASA. And so it's kind of like um, uh, breadcrumbs along a trail. So as, as they make progress along that trail of development, uh, then we continue our, our financial investment <clears throat> and we continue our technical assistance. Likewise, in this model, if a company is having a hard time performing for whatever reason it might be, uh, then those are also off-ramps for NASA as well uh, to go ahead and, and, and end the agreement if it ends up that we can't get things straightened out and then take um, uh, that opportunity to find another partner that we can, uh, we can help uh, with their development. So for Sierra Nevada, uh, they've, uh, uh, and most all of our partners have a number of milestones that usually occur about every three or four months. Uh, but of course, our NASA people are really working with them along the way. There, there can be many things happening that aren't, that aren't directly related to a particular milestone. Uh, for Sierra Nevada, they're coming up on a preliminary design review milestone that will um, uh, mark uh, uh, significant progress in this phase of development, which we call commercial, co commercial crew development phase two or CCDF2. Uh, leading up to this, though, they have many elements of their development that are well beyond preliminary design. Uh, you, uh, they've got some of the rocket motor testing. They've got some wind tunnel testing going on. Um, and so they're, they're moving right along. 
it's, pro- it's probably a good time to talk about what, what is unique about their program, if uh, you think that'd be appropriate. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. So I think when people first see the Sierra Nevada program, which they call the Dream Chaser program, uh, their spacecraft looks very much like a space shuttle. Most people, uh, if they didn't study it real carefully, would think they were looking at the space shuttle. It, it is a lifting body spacecraft, though. It, it doesn't have wings like the space shuttle, at least the wings in a, in a proper technical sense. They call them tip fins. Um, and the reason it's called a lifting body is because half of the lift that the spacecraft produces is actually from the shape of the body of the spacecraft and not the, not the tip fins. But the, when you compare it to the space shuttle, you look at this picture here of it sitting on a runway next to the space shuttle. You can see it's quite a bit smaller than, than the shuttle. It's only about 30 feet long, whereas the, the shuttle is 120 feet long. You know, the space shuttle is dominated by its big cargo bay. Uh, the Dream Chaser spacecraft is dedicated to crew transport. It focuses on that. It can fly up to seven astronauts. Uh, the plan, of course, is to fly to the space station and to serve other markets in the low Earth orbit. And so... Uh, uh, the other departure from the space shuttle approach is that we'll launch on an expendable booster. The, the Dream Chaser is planned to launch on an Atlas V. The Atlas V is pretty much America's main heritage booster. It dates back over 50 years. This is the latest incarnation after all those years of improvement. It has an incredible record of reliability and, and safety. Uh, we're so comfortable with that rocket, we put our multi-billion dollar uh, science payloads on it uh, without any hesitation. And so the Dream Chaser program launches on this Atlas V vehicle. Uh, can fly up to seven crew up to the space station. And then, of course, the other feature, what you have when you have a flying vehicle like this in, instead of a capsule, of course, is it lands on a runway. Um, and so that makes the reusability aspects um, um, you know, much, much more attractive or at least easier to overcome uh, than putting a capsule in the, in the seawater with the corrosion that you tend to have and dealing with that in a, for a reusable spacecraft. <clears throat> The other feature that distinguishes the Dream Chaser program is it's based on non-toxic uh, kind of green propellant technology, both for the main propulsion motors, which are hybrid propulsion motors, uh, as well as for the reaction, <clears throat> excuse me, reaction control system jets. <clears throat> the advantage you have then is that you really could fly the Dream Chaser spacecraft back into almost any airport as long as it has a runway about uh, 7,500 feet long. Uh, with the shuttle, when it lands, we, we have a crew that goes out in protective uh, gear to make sure that none of the toxic propellants are leaking. Uh, certainly, it would be difficult to take the shuttle into just a normal civilian airport. Um, and so one key to commercial spaceflight, commercial human spaceflight, where you're trying to lower cost and then improve safety and reliability, <clears throat> is that getting rid of these toxic propellants is key to that. And so the Dream Chaser, that's one of the, one of the features of the program as well. <clears throat> you know, I sense... Uh and I, you know, talking to everybody associated with the program, it being a new program, obviously, um, commercial crew, but uh, I sense a lot of excitement that surrounds this activity. I even sense it in, you know, your description and some of these um, uh, pictures and that you're talking to. Um, do you do you actually sense that where you are with these companies, especially with Sierra, but, you know, all these companies that uh, are involved in this program? I really think there's a lot of a lot of excitement. I I think because of the pace of the of the development efforts of our commercial partners, uh, as well as the concepts that they're developing. Uh, certainly, me being kind of an airplane guy at heart, the, a flying vehicle uh, appeals to me. Uh, it also certainly appealing uh, from a commercial aspect, in that you uh, can land on runways and because you can fly that on entry, you can fly left and right out of the orbit plane pretty far. We call it cross range. And so every orbit, you have a number of landing opportunities. Also with a lifting body or a high L over D spacecraft, uh, the acceleration or G environment through the flight phases is relatively low. So when you start wanting to fly uh, non-professional astronauts that aren't in peak physical con- physical condition, uh, you have a vehicle that is uh, it provides a more tolerable environment for for kind of normal people to fly to space. Uh, and, of course, also when you have uh, you know, an airplane-type spacecraft that lands on runways uh, and the development effort that goes with that, it's a bit harder than doing a capsule. Uh, but once you conquer those challenges, you end up with some features that, that are pretty attractive. You know, And along those lines, even through development, uh, as far as some of the activities are coming up, uh, you can see a picture here uh, of the the Dream Chaser engineering test article uh, in construction. Uh, it looks black because it's uh, carbon fiber epoxy composite construction. Uh, it's hard to recognize somewhat because the tip fins aren't on yet in this recent picture. 
Uh, but the idea is that in a, in a number of weeks here, this vehicle will be uh, uh, nearly complete. It will actually be taken out to Mojave. <clears throat> it will be flown up to altitude uh, on the uh, Dream Chaser, excuse me, the White Knight 2. That's the scale of composites, uh, Virgin Galactic White Knight 2, planned for their suborbital tourism flights. Uh, just this April and May, we'll be doing some captive carry flights with the, uh, this engineering test article to make sure that the, the two vehicles are compatible. Uh, then that vehicle will be brought back here to Colorado, where all the subsystems will be outfitted for approach and landing tests that will happen later this year. So it will go back out to California. Um, it will go through some more testing, and then it will take, be taken up to altitude. Uh, it will be released from the White Knight 2, and it will uh, descend and, and fly very much uh, very shuttle-like looking uh, uh, descent and landing uh, at the um, uh, Dryden uh, Edwards flight facility in California. So there will be a number of those tests, and in fact, one of those is actually a, one of our finding mo uh, funding milestones. Uh, also, that captive carry flight I talked about is one of the funding milestones as well. <clears throat> so those are some of the exciting things happening in the Dream Chaser program development uh, schedule for this year. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a real fast-paced uh, schedule, the way you've laid that out. And um, I know it, uh, you know, everybody uh, really gets excited hearing updates about what's going on, uh, especially with commercial crew program as it ramps up. And, and uh, this has been a great uh, overview, and we really uh, appreciate you taking the time to um, walk us through, you know, what you're doing with them and what Sierra Nevada is doing in support of the uh, commercial program. So we really appreciate you uh, taking time out to visit with us. Well, thank you, Kyle. I really enjoyed it. And I, I think uh, with the right funding, within four to five years, we'll see the Dream Chaser flying up to the space station and, and providing uh, routine crew transport uh, for the astronauts and scientists. It'll be great. Yeah, well, thanks again. That was uh, Valen Thorne, who is the Commercial Crew Program Partner Manager for Sierra Nevada.